Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Ward Carroll. Joining me is my co-host, Proceedings Editor-in-Chief, Bill Hamlet. Hi, Bill. Hey, Ward. So we're kind of all snowbound here. Seven inches shut down the greater metro D.C. area. I'm sure everybody saw on the news that I-95 between Quantico and basically 495 was shut down for over 24 hours, which is a nightmare since you and I lecture at Quantico and TBS all the time. That that gave me, uh, I shuddered to think we might have been stuck in that that action. Yeah, I was talking to a couple of our Ed Board members today who are Marines. One is uh, one lives on base, uh, A.J. Easton, uh, Sergeant Major. Uh, he lives on base at Quantico. And so he said, fortunately, he was at home. They lost power for like seven hours, but was not on the road on 95, as uh, many Marines who he knew were. And some were stuck for, you know, 18, 20, 24 hours. So a disaster. Yeah, not, not good. Not good. So for those who are watching us on our live stream on our YouTube channel, welcome. We have our producer, Heather, standing by to tee up questions from you. So please jump into the chat. We have a fantastic guest here, somebody who's a mentor and a big influencer to both Bill and I from our J.O. days and mid-days, in fact. Um, so we're very excited to uh, welcome uh, John Lehman back to the podcast. So, Bill, let's let's bring him right in. Yeah, so joining us from Sun Valley, Idaho today, where it looks like he's living in a uh, gorgeous log cabin, is uh, former <laughs> Secretary of the Navy John Lehman. Uh, as I put in my editor's page in the January issue, he was the Secretary of the Navy the, the full four years that I was a midshipman at the Naval Academy. He was Secretary of the Navy from 1981 to 1987 and oversaw the buildup of what was the famous 600-ship Navy under the Reagan administration. Mr. Secretary, great to have you on the show again. Thanks. It's great to be back. And uh, uh, I can't uh, help but point out that we have a lot more snow than you do. And yeah, and yeah. Yeah, but you have good snow. You have good snow. It's not shut down I-95 snow. No. Yeah. Yeah. Idaho, it's the lodge snow. Idaho is equipped for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Secretary, I, we were talking about how we knew you and from the old days when we first, you know, when you were SecNav and I first met you in person when I was a cat one going through VF 101 and you, you spoke to the ready room uh, kind of informally there. Um, and that was circa 1984. Mm. Um, and was, uh, o was Ozer teaching then? Ozer was teaching then. Yeah. In fact, uh, Hank Kleeman was skipper of the rag, right? Uh. Uh, may he rest in <laughs> and Ozer. Um, so those were the, the good old days when, uh, and we mentioned this in the last podcast that we owe our brown shoes to you. <laughs> and our flight jackets and all the other stuff that gave us that esprit that was uh, allowed us to really take pride in being a 13XX during those years. So uh, let me thank you publicly once again for your efforts <laughs> on that front specifically. And I guess you, know, so you were you were flying with VA-42 as a as a reserve BN, right? That's uh, that's right. Yeah, I, uh, I I guess I spent a total of 15 years uh, uh, assigned to the Mat Wing. Uh, as a reservist in uh, in the squadron augment uh, unit there, uh, so uh, I uh, I got to know virtually everybody in the fighter and East Coast fighter and A six world. Yeah, those were, those were good days. We remember often about Hoser and Snort and yeah Goble and all those guys and uh, yeah. Fred Lewis. You know these were the, the uh, Ben right, Fred and Jay Johnson, our yeah, Jay Johnson. CNO. Right. Youngest CNO ever, I guess, right? Is yeah, he, uh, it was too bad. He, was just, he, I'm sure, would have much rather have been a, uh, an attack puke than a fighter puke. But uh, all right, let's, next go best thing. <laughs> let's go with that. So, Bill, let's talk about the Secretary's article. Yeah, so, uh, Mr. Secretary, your article uh, is titled Getting Back on Top, How to Rebuild the Navy. And uh, we asked you, as part of the American Sea Power Project that's been ongoing for about a year now, uh, to write about uh, how, how did the Navy coming out of the Vietnam era, where it had been ridden hard, put away wet, uh, where it was really under-resourced, where it was facing great power competition. So uh, we, this is not the first time that the United States uh, and the United States Navy has faced great power competition. You know, the, the Soviet Navy was a, a great power, a great Navy. 
Uh, and in those uh, circumstances, the late 1970s, the Navy was in, in many ways uh, a situation that it, not, not dissimilar to the one it faces today. And so we asked you uh, to, to share with our readers uh, the lessons from that, that time. Uh, how, how did you get you know, the Navy back on top? How did you rebuild the Navy? How did the Navy rebuild itself? What were the key ingredients uh, from uh, you know earlier 1980s uh, to uh, to really a, a transform Navy by the time you left as Secretary of the Navy in 1987. So uh, the article and I think um, uh, Heather has put the uh, the link in the chat channel here and it's in the January issue of Proceedings. The uh, cover is shown there. The American Sea Power Project. Uh, so again, it's titled uh, "Getting Back on Top: How to Rebuild the Navy." So, sir, uh, just 30,000 foot perspective. What were the first most important things that had to be done uh, as soon as Secretary Re uh, uh, as soon as uh, President Reagan uh, you know took over in, in 1981? Well, uh, first, let me say your your series uh, that you've been publishing over the last year is really remarkable, and uh, I hope you're going to uh, publish it as a as a book. It, it, it's really outstanding, and. Uh, I compliment you guys for what, uh, uh, for the uh, how you got so many first class people, and uh, how good the editing is. So, uh, but with that, to answer your question, uh, it, it it was uh, uh, obviously a, a a large team effort, and it started with our uh, being uh, able to have access. Uh, to uh, uh, a, a very, uh, very wise person running for president in, in uh, President Reagan. He was uh, very interested and instinctively uh, uh, understanding of geopolitics. And so uh, his advisor, Dick Allen, and uh, his informal advisor, Henry Kissinger, uh, started uh, 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 educating him and uh, uh, filling him in early on, really uh, 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 before the 76 uh, uh, election in which he uh, barely lost uh, in the, in the uh, uh, nominating process to uh, President Ford. So when, uh, uh, when the campaign uh, got going, he wanted to spend a lot of time in understanding uh, the military balance and particularly the naval balance. While his experience in World War II was in the army, he, he was a navalist and uh, instinctively. So uh, we had uh, a, a very uh, ready ear in uh, uh, a leader who wanted to understand uh, the, the realities of the naval balance and the influence of the naval balance on, uh, uh, on the, the Cold War. And so we spent a lot of time bringing him up to speed on, on uh, uh, the uh, strategy first and uh, uh, the hardware, the budget issues, the fact that we were, as we are today, disarming through cost overruns and uh, lack of competition and so forth. So when he got, uh, when he won the election, we had hit, we hit the ground running because we had a lot of uh, a lot of work done uh, uh, before the election. Uh, it, luckily, we had a, 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 a succession of CNOs. Uh, starting with Admiral Zumwalt, uh, who was focused on strategy and the military balance and how badly we were falling behind. And then Jim Holloway, who was a veteran of three wars, counting the Cold War, uh, and was also strategy minded. And then followed with Tom Hayward, also who was strategy minded. And not every naval leader has been a strategist or, or even aware of the role of strategy. But we, the Navy was very lucky to have three uh, uh, uniform leaders who, who really, uh, really did understand it. And, uh, and so we uh, 
uh, when the administration came in, we'd already done an awful lot of work to prepare a major increase in the budget. But first and foremost, to have a new strategy. And that, uh, <laughs> as today, uh, the first uh, vacuum we, we uh, have to deal with in the naval balance is no strategy. And uh, uh, that's really got to be this, the, the starting point for all naval efforts, because if you can't explain why you want the hardware, why you want the people, why you want to train them in a certain way, why you need certain kinds of weapon systems and uh, communications and, and all of the infrastructure that goes with naval power. If, if you can't explain why you need it, how it is going to pay for itself in defending this country, how you are going to use it to deter our enemies. And if uh, deterrence fails for whatever reason, uh, to prevail in a conflict and bring it to an early conclusion, then you, you know you're you're wasting your time because you you've got to have a simple logic that can be understood even in Congress, uh, and as important or more important among the American people, strategy, good strategy, is never complex and always logical, and hence explainable in simple declarative sentences uh, to the people that have to vote for it and have to pay for it. And so that's what we concentrated on. First was the strategy, which was to take advantage of the tremendous uh, uh, benefits we have from geography. We, uh, we uh, the uh, uh, Atlantic Alliance and our Asian allies really had uh, fundamental control of the seas if we chose to to achieve it. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union was uh, landlocked, uh, no warm water ports, uh, and uh, and was really uh, 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 had built all its power, uh, as one would expect, uh, in its land forces, and uh, then when they, uh, in their overconfidence, decided to launch off under Admiral Gorshkov to uh, 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 try to acquire uh, naval supremacy, uh, that was clearly a bridge too far for them and gave us also the ability to, to illustrate to uh, Congress and the American public that here is a whole new level of threat uh, and uh, and yet we have the advantages uh, without breaking the bank uh, to uh, uh, make sure we uh, uh, achieve and to maintain naval supremacy, which clearly will uh, balance overbalance the land supremacy that the Warsaw Pact had with 180 divisions in the Central Front. Uh, with NATO never able to generate more than 40. Uh, but to have total naval supremacy uh, neutralized that and reestablished uh, deterrence and uh, the capability to start uh, uh, moving from just containment of uh, the Soviet Union to rolling it back. And uh, the president really got this and drove it, the strategy, uh, to build a Navy and Marine Corps that clearly could execute a forward strategy and would prevail in a naval war. And in so doing, bring pressures to bear on the Soviet Union that would force them back and to uh, uh, ultimately uh, lose the Cold War without fighting. Uh, from the very first, Ronald Reagan believed that we could win the Cold War and not in uh, measured in decades, but in years uh, without uh, doing battle. So that gave us the great strength 
to then proceed to uh, lay out the forward strategy and how we would use this 600 ship Navy to see that the Soviets uh, could no longer continue to try to uh, use their land power balance uh, to uh, take more and more uh, political advantage and to do things like invade Afghanistan and uh, uh, to uh, declare the Brezhnev doctrine and, and so forth. Uh, Ronald Reagan believed that uh, instinctively. So we had no trouble in getting, we the Navy uh, uh, had no trouble in uh, getting the funding that we needed in the budget. It was a large uh, change of direction in budgeting uh, to achieve the 600 ship Navy and then to sell it on the Hill. Uh, we really uh, uh, won every major debate and even the minor debates on the Hill over what we were doing and why we needed 100 nuclear attack subs and why we needed 100 frigates and why we needed the, uh, uh, the, the new super uh, 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 Tomcats and uh, A6Fs and uh, uh, all of the other uh, slick 32s and uh, Seawiz and so forth. Uh, and, and we won every debate, uh, even in uh, uh, a Congress that was uh, uh, either uh, uh, dominated or controlled by the Democrats. Uh, or in a very close balance. So that, that is uh, really the, the long and the short of it. He, he supported, uh, I mean, we were in one meeting, I remember that uh, uh, during the transition, and he said, well, we're, gonna, we're sending this up. We have the budget all prepared. Uh, it's a major change of direction, but how do we demonstrate to the Soviets that this is not just a political change. This is a bipartisan supported fundamental shift in the West's strategy and capability to end the Cold War. And so uh, uh, we had, uh, uh, luckily, in that transition meeting, we had uh, the ability to say, well, Mr. President, we have a, we really have a, uh, just what you're looking for every summer that NATO has major exercises of hundreds of ships from all the NATO navies, especially led by the United States. And, uh, uh, but we haven't really taken advantage of that, even though these uh, exercises go on every, every year, uh, both in the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the, the Pacific, uh, they, we have uh, uh, been prevented in using the Navy where it could really have some political effect. And that is by going north to the, where their vulnerabilities are into the Norwegian Sea and the Bering Sea and the Barents and uh, uh, demonstrating that we have the capability to hit them very hard uh, strategically and going after uh, their assets uh, deep in the Soviet Union as well as their forces that are, uh, would be uh, uh, attempting to attack uh, NATO. And so we told him, all we have to do, if, get, if you give us permission, we will use this year's exercise uh, called at the time Ocean Venture and uh, go north, burst north of the GIUK gap where we haven't had mobile carriers for 20 years and uh, start practicing hitting them up there where their vulnerabilities are, where in effect they really don't have any real defense about what we can do. And, but we've got to show them that we can do it. We've got to demonstrate it. We've got to fly in those willy walls and those snow storms and uh, chip the ice off the, the radars and uh, uh, that we really are serious about this. And, and he said, uh, Terrific, let's do that. And, and, and then we had to say, uh, well, uh, one little problem here, uh, you've got to tell us to do it. Uh, we cannot go through the Joint Chiefs of Staff because that will take five years <laughs> and will, is certain to leak. 
and we can't take it, we can't go over to NATO uh, and ask NATO's permission or shape's position. Um, and you don't need to do that because uh, there is no decision against us going, going up there. So uh, he, he really loved that. And he said, yes, let's do it. And so uh, uh, Ace Lions, we had just put in as, uh, as the uh, strike fleet uh, uh, commander. And he was, uh, you know, at the time he was the Navy's patent. He was, uh, uh, had really thought through uh, the disciplines of uh, cover and deception and uh, uh, operating uh, in uh, uh, MCON and, uh, uh, and, and, and really he, he was exactly the right uh, aggressor. And of course, then he was a product of, of uh, a part of the Navy that doesn't exist and has been done away with and needs to be restored and rebuilt. And that is what OP 06 was really the plans and the, the home of strategy in the, in the Navy, the home of uh, strategic thinkers who were operators when they came back from sea duty, they, they would be, uh, there was a center to go to of people who were strategic thinkers who were uh, not only operators, but uh, strategists. And uh, if I could just ask a question to that point about strategists, Navy strategists and Navy strategy. Uh, so when we have a lot, you know, conversations with uh, authors and with our editorial board and, you know, what, what where is the Navy lacking in strategy? The Navy has, as, as uh, Bob Work wrote in Proceedings in December, uh, has had a series of strategies over the last, you know, 20 something years uh, post Cold War None of them have really resonated, I think, with political leaders and with, uh, with, with even, you know, perhaps the, the Navy itself. Um, is that is that a uh, is that a product of Goldwater Nichols of the jointification of the military? You know, that happened just as you were leaving uh, as SecNav. So, you know, Goldwater Nichols was 1986, the creation of the COCOMs, and you know, the Joint Staff took, you know. Became more powerful, the COCOM, you know, uh, chain of command directly through the Secretary of Defense. Uh, so I'm just curious your perspective on that. You know, getting back to this, say hey, you got to have a strategy, you got to have a naval strategy. A lot of folks today, I think, would say, well, we don't have one because the the Navy, the services have become much more focused on their Title Ten responsibilities, which man, train, and equip, whereas the you know, the strategy for how to use the force is much more in the joint domain or in the COCOM domain. Just curious your thought on that. Well, of course, it, the, the system was was still set up that way back then. We didn't have Goldwater Nichols, and Goldwater Nichols uh, ha, has had many pernicious effects uh, in personnel management, in, in uh, strategy and homogenizing as if there's some common strategy that will give uh, equal roles to uh, uh, to every service in equal share. Uh, and it's just totally uh, uh, really corrupted the whole the whole uh, system, especially strategy. The fact that every strategy has to be uh, joint and the world is not uh, joint Army, Navy, Air Force. Uh, it, it's unreal. So uh, but there are a lot of other issues involved, many of them derivative from uh, from Goldwater Nichols. For instance, that the, the good part of Goldwater Nichols was it, it did give the COCOMs uh, a, a, a proper role to some extent uh, in the control of the training of their uh, uh, forces from all the services. They had a much bigger say. But the bad part of what of the power that was given to the COCOMs was that uh, no longer could the uh, uh, Secretary of the Navy and, uh, uh, and the uh, Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant uh, say how long uh, uh, they needed to, uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, readiness for repair and overhaul for, uh, for the morale of the troops. I mean, we you know, learned time after time over the centuries really that you can't deploy a Navy and leave it deployed longer than a certain time, particularly now 
when most of the sailors are married. And uh, if you do that, and we've learned, uh, and the statistics are uh, voluminous, that six months is about the longest you can do on a, re a long-term basis without forcing uh, married sailors, male and female, out of the service because it, it just doesn't work. And the, the maintenance uh, backlogs are horrendous. When we had, uh, when the Reagan administration came in, uh, we had over 50 ships that were uh, awaiting overhaul with no date in, in sight. Uh, the same with uh, aircraft uh, awaiting overhaul. So, uh, and, and you recall there were headlines about uh, just in Norfolk alone, there were in the year uh, before the election, there were four ships that simply couldn't uh, deploy because they didn't have enough people. And uh, uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, when, when uh, I was secretary, uh, we had the, uh, the under Title X, we had the ability, the service secretaries and the service chiefs could say no to you come. You can't have a carrier for another two months because we don't have one. Uh, if you keep the one you've got, you're going to destroy the readiness for the next time. So uh, the secretaries and the uh, chiefs had more clout over their own forces, not based on operational uh, strategy or tactics, but on, on the uh, uh, readiness and the uh, training and the morale. But that's gone now under uh, Goldwater Nichols, which is, which is really a shame. There's another factor as well. And this requirement to have uh, that Goldwater Nichols put into law that uh, to be eligible for uh, uh, consideration to go before a flag board to be promoted to admiral or general, you had to have four years of staff duty. And where does that come from? Well, in the Navy and the other operational services, it comes out of training time and deployment time and experience. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so that degrades the readiness, degrades the, uh, the capabilities. Uh, and <laughs> it would be one thing, I mean, obviously it's important to have uh, 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 some experience and uh, awareness and uh, understanding of, of, of joint decision-making and joint staffing. But when I left the service, when I left the SECNAV, there were seven JTFs, Joint Task Forces. Today, there are over 250 because they had to create all these JTFs to have a joint, joint staffs, even though they might be sitting around reading newspapers, they, because they had to check the box. Every, uh, every officer who wanted to be, to make it uh, at least a consideration for flag had to spend four years sit sitting in a, a joint staff. There was no such requirement for operational duty. Uh, no law that says you have to be able to fly an airplane or drive a submarine but you have to be able to be in a staff. Well, that's, that's a, a, a wrong, wrong ethos to, to force into the culture of all the services. So, but other than that, uh, Goldwater Nichols was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you codified that tempo and purse tempo um, in a way that was never done before. I remember very distinctly the message coming out that said, okay, six months deployed, followed by 12 months interdeployment, training cycle minimum. And if you're going to break this, you're going to have to basically tell me why. And as you said, that's just mm -hmm. completely eradicated now. And I've been preaching for years that the, the bow wave of readiness and retention is going to catch up with us as soon as the economic situation comes out of the COVID environment. You're going to see, and we heard about this today, Bill, at the editorial board, we're talking about some of this that's happening, starting to nibble at the fringes of this. But as you said, Mr. Secretary, it seems like we're relearning these lessons that you had, you know, acted against in, in actual policy. You know, yeah. the first time I heard about op tempo versus purse tempo was on your watch. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the, uh, one of the things that Goldwater Nichols instilled was decision making by committee as opposed to line authority and accountability. 
And uh, that's true in, you know, uh, the, way, the way we now, all the services have, have to, what they have to go through to acquire any new system has to be joint. There's the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Committees. And so, you know, it's, it's not an accident that uh, three of the last big Navy uh, ship programs have turned out to be camels because they've been designed by committees. And uh, the old line authority uh, is, has just been so degraded to almost not exist in the services, particularly in procurement. And a result of that, there's no competition. They call it competition. Uh, but it's really uh, running a beauty contest for a 50 year monopoly. And so the costs, uh, uh, I, I hope uh, uh, everybody reads Arnold Panaro's uh, wonderful book about uh, uh, what's been happening, which basically points out and puts all the data to show that we're spending today about the same in constant dollars as we were at the height of the Reagan administration, but we're getting one third of the product. The rest has been eaten up by overhead and by runaway costs because there's no competition. Everything's joint. You can't fire a project manager. You say, you know, a few have been fired, but unjustly because they don't have the authority. Everything's the authority is a, a, a series of committees. And, uh, and so now we're we're taking an average of about 23 to 24 years from start of a program to first uh, deployments. And that compares to the much more complex uh, uh, Polaris and uh, Minuteman programs that took from the back of the envelope to the first deployment of George Washington, four years. That's Five years under uh, defense acquisition regulations, five years to get a, uh, to go through all the processes to get a joint requirement paper before you can even establish a, a program of record. I mean, it's crazy what uh, we've allowed to happen. Well, it's how yeah. we went from prototype to IOC in three years. Three years, right. So, and, and it went from uh, the super to go to the super, uh, Tomcat, as you remember, uh, every time I went to Oceana, I practically got beat up by the uh, the fighter guys because of that lousy TF uh, uh, thirty engine. Uh, and uh, so, to put a new engine, the, the the GE engine, a new digital data bus that turned the airplane into a, a, a data bus attack capabilities with precision delivery systems to make it an F-15E uh, fighter and attack capability, that took us two and a half years. And if we'd gone through, the, if we'd asked the defense uh, uh, department to, uh, for them to do it through the system, it would have been 23 years just to go from the, uh, the A to the D. But then you rolled say. out, you rolled out and that buy was necked down to 55, right? The D never had air to mud capability until very late. Yeah. And uh, it all got perturbated because the strategy that you were talking about, which is thank you for your input. We know what we want to do. We're doing it just became procurement by committee from that point yeah. forward. Um, that's right. And that's what we have today. Right. You can't, you can't, well, you can't fire anybody or, or, uh, uh, discipline anybody because nobody is in charge. It's it's all a committee process. It's just crazy. <laughs> I, I want to uh, just switch gears for a second to go back. You mentioned a few minutes ago uh, Ocean Venture, uh, 1981, a, a large exercise up above the GI UK gap. It was the first of many. And as JO's uh, ward and I were both on carriers, where we went up into Vest Fjord or Anda Fjord off the, the coast of Nor Norway. Uh, we have a question from Lieutenant Kyle Craig, who's a proceedings article, uh, proceedings author, I'm sorry. Uh, he, he writes a lot for us, a very, very thoughtful J.O. Uh, his question is, could China's uh, maritime, so he says uh, Ocean Venture pushed naval operations up to the Soviet maritime flanks in the, north, in the high north. Could China's maritime flank today 
be the Indian Ocean and its trade. Your thoughts on that, sir? Well, I think we have to we have to realize that that the geography and the the the, the, uh, the indus, industrial base uh, of of the and the military uh, capabilities of China versus the Soviet Union are totally different. Uh, and it, it, what we did, the reason we we did that on the flanks of Petropavlovsk and off Murmansk and off. Uh, the White Sea and under the ice cap was because that's where the Soviet vulnerabilities were. The vulnerabilities in some ways are similar with China, but in, for the most part, very different. And that's why so far, uh, the only one that has been speaking out uh, uh, about uh, the, the real vulnerabilities of China has been the Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, because the uh, China, China has very real vulnerabilities, but for the most part, it's much more in trade uh, and commerce and the classic Gerda curse, where uh, uh, they, they are now spread with the, the very vulnerabilities that they uh, exacerbated for themselves has been uh, the Belt and Road Initiative because there are lots and lots of choke points along that Belt and Road. It's not all inland. In fact, it's connected more than ever uh, by uh, legs that are seaborne legs. They have the, the vulnerabilities of all of the straits and all of the choke points in, in uh, trade today, which is why they've been so obsessed by the South China Sea, because that's, uh, that is a major set of choke points. Uh, they, they're not after the South China Sea to build a fortress. They're there because they know their commerce, so much of it has to go through that. So the Commandant is reordering uh, the Marine Corps to be able to strike all over the world at those vulnerabilities. For instance, there are 50,000 islands, most of them uninhabited, or many of them uninhabited in the Pacific, 50,000 islands, most of which can be used as a temporary base uh, for interdiction forces or missiles or uh, mining and so forth, uh, and and then move on to a different one. This is uh, the commandant has been taking a lot of flack for the changes, but he's got the right idea, and it, it's trying to imitate, uh, uh, have our strategy built around what we did to win the Cold War, is is not the right approach. Is to look realistically at the geopolitical vulnerabilities of China and, uh, and they are real and vulnerable and to start to build a force and to uh, promulgate a, uh, a strategy that really puts them at risk. And uh, uh, so uh, if, if the most important thing to think about strategy is it's got to be simple and logical. You've got, if you can't explain it to your taxi driver, um, then it, it's, you better think, think through what, what you're uh, uh, trying to do because it's got to be simple and robust. And uh, uh, China has many more vulnerabilities uh, than uh, the Soviet Union had in, in, in trying to carry out what they're trying to do. However, the most disturbing thing about uh, what is emerging rapidly is the recreation of, a, of a, 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 another axis, uh, that, such as uh, the Germans and Italians and uh, Japanese put together in the late 30s and early 40s, and um, even though they had no common interests, no strategic interests, the only thing they had was a common enemy, us. Today, Iran, Russia, and China are doing the same thing, except they've carried it much further uh, than the World War II axis. They're now really training together because they foresee many ways, many, since we have allowed our forces to shrink and they're going to continue to shrink under the budgets that are being proposed, uh, they see real opportunity to work together. Okay, if China wants Taiwan, they coordinate so that Russia uh, chooses to go into the Ukraine or the more probably uh, early on the, the Baltics, 
to reestablish the cordon sanitaire that they uh, they crave. And uh, Iran can uh, will be coordinated in that. Well, we in, in t- you remember in the bad old days in the Carter, uh, the bad old naval days of the Carter administration, their uh, excuse for shrinking the fleet was, well, we can swing. We have a swing strategy If the Soviets attack in the North German plain. We will swing the seventh fleet uh, around to the Atlantic. Well, that was crazy. It never had any logic to it. And of course, they they dropped it towards the end of the Carter administration. Well, we're stuck with a, a swing strategy today more than we ever were during those Carter years because um, we have we we only have a, a fleet half the size of the six hundred ship navy, and we have areas of of real national interest and vital interest spread over a much broader area than we had in the Cold War. And, uh, and, and our adversaries know it. And so they are going to, they're not going to take uh, dramatic action without it being coordinated. And we have no way to deal with that with the size fleet we have today. No matter how joint, uh, obviously we're all of naval planning involves the, 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 the corporation of the army and the Air Force and the Coast Guard uh, and the Marines, obviously, but they, uh, uh, even with all of that, uh, the world is too large and our fleet is too small. The sea is great and we are small. Sir, uh, I've got a couple of questions from the audience. I'll try to fuse these together because they, they, they all kind of touch on one theme, which is uh, to procurement and force structure. And you're, you're just, your comment a second ago that our fleet is too small. Uh, and also, I want to touch on one of the major uh, themes that came out of your article that, that really resonated with me. So first to the theme that was in your article, which is that, you know, you said, uh, while under-resourced during the Carter years, uh, for a bunch of different reasons, there was a, uh, you know, some people were, were uh, uh, you know, trying to believe what the Soviets were talking about in terms of detente and and, and looking for ways to, to do national defense on the cheap, et cetera. But there were some key systems that had been built, like Los Angeles class submarines were already under underway, under production. You had Slick 32 and SeaWiz and Aegis cruisers, uh, all of those capabilities and the F-14 Tomcat, you know, et cetera. Uh, and, and all it to build that 600 ship Navy, the initial push for the, the Reagan administration was, get more money behind those things that are already going well, right? Those those capabilities that we're building, but we just need more of them. And if you can build more of them and build up the force with more SSNs, uh, that you could, you could start to build a fleet towards that 600 ship goal. So the questions that we're getting from a couple of our, uh, you know, our audience today are along that lines is, you know, where do you see capabilities, um, should we be buying some small uh, combatants that perhaps our, our, uh, our allies build well, like Japan, Germany, uh, South Korea, all build some small combatants that we could uh, add to the U.S. Navy cheaply and, and acquire them inexpensively uh, that might help us build the numbers of the fleet quickly. Uh, a related question is along the lines of unmanned systems. So, you know, the Navy has been experimenting the joint force has also been experimenting with uh, with unmanned capabilities. Uh, is there a, a potential that you see there for building up the number or the size of the Navy quickly to deal with the problems that faces the Navy today? Well, I, you know, I, 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 I think uh, uh, as a, uh, a strategy, it isn't a strategy. It, it's it, the, the biggest problem today still is we have no strategy. So uh, when people ask you, well, how are you going to use those small patrol boats that the Europeans built so well? Or how are you going to use uh, uh, these uh, aircraft that uh, uh, we, we can uh, uh, buy on the cheap? Uh, you don't have an answer because just having hardware if, if you can't explain how you're going to use it and why it's the right choice of weapons, uh, it, it's not going to fly. 
And the problem uh, that, that we face is that uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's not one that, that everybody thinks we're so polarized that people can't agree on anything. Uh, you know, the, the Carter years were a good example. We really had a bipartisan defense policy. Scoop Jackson and John Stennis and, and, uh, and many in the House uh, were uh, just as strong and just as innovative and just as supportive as the Republicans led by John Tower and others on, on the, uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, and in the, uh, the administration, you had some very uh, uh, naive and, and uh, pro-soft power anti-naval people around the president at the time in the White House, but you had some very, very uh, realistic, uh, experienced uh, experts and uh, officials in the Pentagon and in, in uh, some in the National Security Council. It was a, a good bipartisan mis mix. And while uh, Harold Brown was uh, uh, focused on, uh, very centrally on Europe and was not a navalist uh, and had no experience with the Navy, nevertheless, uh, he was a strong supporter of, the, of seeing that the services and the Navy uh, had the highest technology that this was our really our, our ace in the hole in uh, the, the, the Cold War. The Soviet Union for every, all of its deployment of, of uh, uh, technology basically stole it from the uh, West, from NATO and from the US, which was in ultimately a great weakness for them. And the Chinese, uh, by the way, are suffering from some of the same, same problems. But if it weren't for the fact that the, the Democrats in, in uh, the Carter period supported Aegis, Seawoods, Slick 32, many of the highly classified programs, if they, they wouldn't let, us, let the Navy buy, buy them, but they did fund carrying them through to, uh, uh, to IOCs. Uh, you know, they were going to procure what we had, uh, the program we inherited when we came in was one Aegis cruiser a year was all the Navy was going to be allowed to, to buy. <laughs> well, uh, we'd still be uh, trying to get the 600 ship Navy if, if it was that rate. So we immediately went to at least three so we could have two. And I had to make uh, a, a significant uh uh, horse trade and deals with uh, the armed services committees, particularly dominated as they were by the Southerners, to uh, uh, to to give certain programs uh, to their yards so that we could get Bath Ironworks uh, uh, allowed in to compete with uh, Pascagoula to build more Aegis wheels. We felt we had, had to have more Aegis cruisers to have a credible ability to defeat. Uh, the Soviet fleet. Similarly with the tax subs, we had to get uh, uh, competition into uh, uh, building the subs. And, and that's, by the way, how we were able to actually uh, have eight billion of cost underruns because of that competition. And uh, uh, that's what we need to do today because we have no competition. Everything is everything is uh, uh, allocated. Uh, there's a little bit of minor competition in, uh, around the edges, but it's not a, a competitive system. And that's why we're now getting one third of the output uh, that we used to get when we had competition. So we have a question from uh, Chris Taylor, one of our viewers. Uh, he asked a question about Afghanistan, which has certainly been in the news and, and in the pages of proceedings the last uh, few months. Uh, the question is, with the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban and the recent mining deals, business deals that the PRC has brokered there, do you foresee Afghanistan to be the next grounds for a proxy war? No, I do not. Uh, <laughs> I remember, uh, uh, I mean, uh, all, all of my uh, uh, education was centered around uh, geopolitics and and. Uh, international uh, uh, relations. And 
uh, one of my mentors uh, was my professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Robert Strazepe. And when he was asked about why he never talked about Latin America, he would say, well, Latin America is a dagger poised at the heart of Antarctica. And I think you could say the same about Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is a dagger uh, poised at, at the heart of Ouagadougou. It's, it's, uh, it, it's just not a major geopolitical factor. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, uh, adjacent and sharing borders with our principal adversaries, uh, Russia and China. And so, you know, uh, it's, I, I'm not going to comment on the way we, the disastrous way we withdrew, uh, or whether we should have withdrawn completely. But the fact is, what they now do with their neighbors is shouldn't be a major uh, concern to us. In fact, uh, good luck to China in its dealings with uh, the, the seven major tribes of Afghanistan, and good luck to Russia. I, I wish them well. <laughs> yeah. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah, yeah all right. Uh, sir, we, we do not have a whole lot more time. I wanted to ask just because, uh, you know, Warden, I remember you very well from our, our JO days, our midshipman days. But for our, our younger listeners these days, uh, you know, thinking about the nineteen or the 1980s, uh, to them is uh, is akin to us uh, when, when uh, Ward and I were midshipmen, you know, probably to the 1940s and 50s. But uh, you became a secretary of the Navy in 1981, and you were, I think, 39 years old. Um, 38. 38 years old. Uh, how did that happen? How did, how did that come to be? Well, I, I, I think it was a, a natural evolution, really, because uh, my dad was a... a, a, a heavily combat uh, uh, skipper uh, in the Pacific, skipper of an LCS. Uh, and he stayed in the reserves. Uh, in fact, we had a, had a naval tradition. My great grandfather was in the Union Navy in the Civil War. And my fourth great grandfather was, uh, was a uh, privateer in the revolution. And so it, it, I, I, I was brought up Navy. Um, and uh, I, uh, I was really, since we lived uh, in a Philadelphia suburb, uh, under the flight path of Willow Grove Naval Air Station, uh, there wasn't a day went by I didn't hear or see uh, uh, jets and uh, Corsairs and so forth. So I really wanted to be Navy. And uh, I finally got my wish when I was a senior in college. I was accepted into uh, AOCS and, uh, and flight school. Uh, and... Uh, and so I stayed in the reserves. Uh, I started, you know, serving in the reserves right away. And I stayed in it actively, uh, drilling and flying, uh, flying for 20 years and in the reserves uh, uh, for 25 years. And, uh, and uh, but my, my uh, academic interest and my personal interest really was in history and geopolitics and power politics and uh, and defense policy and and uh, engineering and so forth. And so I spent um, uh, my academic uh, career was in at, starting at St. Joe's and then in uh, Cambridge, England, and then back at the University of Pennsylvania, all geopolitics, international law, international economics, and so forth. So it was natural when I... Uh, 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 I, my first job out of graduate school actually was working for Henry Kissinger and Dick Allen uh, in the Nixon NSC. So in that role, I, uh, I got to know George Bush. Uh, I never did meet uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, but I met uh, many of his advisors and, and so forth. And so uh, when uh, 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 when uh, President Ford was defeated, uh, I, uh, I left. I worked for Kissinger for eight straight years, and then I went into the private uh, sector um, and for four years. But I worked to help uh, Bush, particularly uh, in uh, uh, his campaigning. 
And when he withdrew, uh, I was asked to go with, uh, as a defense advisor with, uh, uh, with the Reagan people. And so um, the combination of my, uh, my flying interests, my Navy reserve status, uh, and my experience on the NSC and the State Department negotiating with the Russians and so forth. Uh, when the time came, um, Dave Abshire and I were appointed heads of the uh, transition for State Defense, CIA, and the whole national security sector. So um, it was uh, uh, obvious to me that where I wanted to be, even though uh, at the time, uh, the uh, president wanted me to go to the State Department. I'm the president-elect, and Al Haig wanted me to be Undersecretary of State. Uh, but I said, no, I, uh, the, the Navy really, really it, it, it needs a change of direction and leadership and, and procurement and so forth. And I know, uh, I think I know what really is wrong and how to fix it. So. That's why I was picked. Fantastic. Well, sir, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for writing for Proceedings. Uh, just to recap, uh, your article is in the January issue of Proceedings. It's titled Getting Back on Top, How to Rebuild the Navy. Uh, it was great to have you writing for uh, for us. Great great working with you as, uh, as your editor for this uh, issue, this article. And thanks for your time today and for your service as Secretary of the Navy. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, it's good to be, always good to be back with you guys. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, that wraps up another fantastic episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Uh, always great to be able to interview a personal hero and uh, somebody who played a pivotal role in, in our lives. And uh, until next week, just remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. We'll catch you again soon.